Hi, welcome to another presentation on ecology. We're going to be talking about the relationships between organisms this time, right? We're going to start with a quick walkthrough of the different trophic levels. We have the producers. Producers make their own food from abiotic factors, meaning they take carbon dioxide from the air or they take water from the soil, sorry, they take carbon dioxide from the air and water from the soil, combine them to become sugar, glucose, through photosynthesis. That's what plants generally do. There are actually other types of producers other than these photosynthesizers. There are also organisms that can use other chemicals, for example, found in deep sea vents. We have those that use sulfur as an energy source, but we don't talk about them here for lower secondary science. Let's focus on plants. Okay. For plants, it should be reminded that algae are also considered plants. They can photosynthesize, but of course they are very different from most terrestrial plants. And not to forget, the algae are not the only unusual or less commonly seen plants on the surface. We also have mosses, we have ferns, they also count as plants. But something that most people don't think of normally are cyanobacteria. These are bacteria that can photosynthesize or maybe phytoplankton. These are very small microscopic plant-like cells or organisms that can also photosynthesize. Phytoplankton are found in water bodies. Mostly they find they are found in the sea or oceans, or maybe lakes. The phytoplankton are very important as the producers of the water food chains, or I would say aquatic food chains. Okay, next let's talk about herbivores. Herbivores are animals that consume plants only. Can herbivores eat meat, however? Actually, some herbivores may, but not as part of their steady diet. A herbivore is an animal that has its main diet consist of plant material. This could be anything from grass to berries and fruits. Next, let's talk about carnivores. Carnivores are animals that eat animals only. But again, are there carnivores that can eat plants? Yes, there are. There are some cases where a carnivore may consume small amounts of plant material, but they do not use it as a main food source. A carnivore is an animal whose main food source is meat, other animals. Okay, and then we have omnivores. Omnivores are animals that eat both plants and meats as part of their steady diet. More versatile in that respect. Now this is uh, something interesting for you to know. There is a way to tell whether an animal is a herbivore, omnivore, carnivore by looking at their dentition, that is to say their teeth. Different animals adapt to their diets by having different types of teeth or dentition. You'll find that omnivores have a combination of teeth traits from both a herbivore and a carnivore. Okay, now another type of consumer rarely discussed are the scavengers and or the, the tritivores. These are animals that consume tissues of dead organisms. You may be already be familiar with some of these vultures, flies, but they are not the only ones. For example, ants, cockroaches, earthworms, these are consumers that feed on the sort of dead material, but make no mistake, they still consume organic material. However, we don't normally include them as part of the food chain. 
They, however, do play a very important role in food chains overall. Because without them, the big dead pieces of organic material would not be broken down into simpler materials. But then we have the decomposers. The decomposers break down dead organisms, dead materials also, but unlike the scavengers, decomposers feed on very small particles and they break things down into very, very simple molecules. They break things down to a molecular level. By doing this, the chemicals or the molecules can be recycled. Plants are able to reuse them and grow and that allows the cycle of nutrients to continue within a food chain. Okay, now we're going to discuss some relationships between organisms in terms of the behavior we can observe. The most simple of these are the predator-prey relationships. In this, a predator hunts other animals for food the animals which are hunted, we call them prey. For example, a tiger is a predator while a deer is its prey. This is fairly straightforward, but there's something else we can consider in this. Very frequently in predator-prey relationships, both the predator and the prey have adaptations the predator tends to be adapted to be able to hunt their prey better. The prey has adaptations to allow them to be able to escape the predator much better. This is a mutual arms race, where both are constantly adapting and trying to one-up the other. A common tactic used is camouflage. And you can see here a few examples of animals Developing camouflage to either allow them to hunt better, stalking their prey, or allow them to escape their predators. In another example, we have the development of poisons. Now, animals that develop poisons, I would like to remind you, are different from venomous animals. The difference between poison and venom is that poison is not used as an offensive. Animals which produce poison use it more as a defensive mechanism and these animals usually have very bright colors and that will allow them to signal to potential predators that they are not to be eaten. Don't eat me, I am poisonous. If you eat me, you will die or suffer. Venomous animals, on the other hand, employ their venom in hunting, in killing other animals. Now here I would like to sidetrack a little bit in state of animals. Let's talk about plants a little bit. Most plants do develop poisons in them. Some of them might surprise you. For example, the common potato actually produces a type of poison called soyanin and if you eat the green parts of a potato after it has started sprouting, you can actually get poisoned by it. There are many parts of plants that produce poison that we may not know of because we don't usually come in contact with them. But the people who harvest or work with, they are usually more aware of this. So the foods that you eat, that you eat plants, may seem safe, but some of them may actually have the capacity for developing poisons. It's just that we only select for those parts where there are no poisons. And in many cases, anyway, if you cook them, you will destroy the poison. So generally, it's a good idea to cook our food. Okay. Now, another type of relationship between organisms is something we call mutualism. This is different from the word symbiosis. Mutualism refers to a relationship where both organisms benefit. 
Now, some people may still be using the older term symbiosis, but symbiosis is more like a word that describes any sort of relationship between organisms. Mutualism is a specific type of symbiosis. In mutualism, two organisms cooperate somewhat, bringing benefit to each other. This may either be done consciously or unconsciously. A very simple example is the pollination of flowers. Flowers produce nectar or have sweet smells or in some cases nasty smells that attract animals such as bees that come to feed on their nectar. In doing so, the bee ends up collecting some pollen and when they visit other flowers, they help spread the pollen grains from one flower to another, thereby helping the plants fertilize and allows them to reproduce. So this is a form of mutualism between plant and animal. Another type of mutualism between animal and animal would be the clownfish and the sea anemone. The sea anemone is not actually a plant. The sea anemone, with all those tentacle things, they are actually animals, but a very unusual kind of animal most people don't see. These are sea creatures. The clownfish is able to live harmlessly in the anemone. The anemone actually produces certain, uh, how do I say, stings that can end up stinging other animals if they were to come close to it. But the clownfish has a coat of mucus around its body that allows it to not be harmed by these stings. So how do they benefit from each other? Whenever the clownfish hunts and brings back scraps of food, the anemone is able to feed off a bit of that food. If any food wanders into the sea anemone's tentacles and gets trapped and paralyzed, the clownfish may or may not also feed on that. Okay. And to give one other type of mutualism, this time between non-animals, there is the common lichen. And you can see this over here. This is what you normally find on tree barks or stones. That slightly green, pale green thing is actually a combination of two types of organisms. There's a fungus and algae. Fungi and algae are able to coexist together in this complex relationship called lichen. The fungi provides a place for the algae to live in. The algae photosynthesizes and produces food that the fungi can absorb and use for its own growth. And in the lower right corner, we have crocodile or alligator. I can't tell from this angle. There we have a bird that can safely pick off pieces of food from the crocodile's mouth between its teeth. In this case, it is getting a free dental treatment. So there's a benefit, food for the bird and teeth cleaning for the crocodile. Okay. Now a third type of relationship between organisms is commensalism. This is a relationship between two organisms in which one is beneficial to the other, but the other doesn't get any benefit. So we say it is neutral to the other organism. A very common example we usually give is the remora with the sharks. These are small fish remora, they stick to or cling to the shark as it goes around hunting. The remora is able to feed on the food scraps left behind by the shark. In this case, the shark doesn't really get any benefit from the romora, but the romora is able to get a food source out of that shark. 
that's also the case of the buffaloes and the birds that live near them. Sometimes these birds, you can find them hanging on the backs on the buffalo. Whenever the buffalo moves and wades through water, it tends to stir up insects or small fish that the birds take advantage of. Okay. The fourth type of relationship is parasitism. This is a relationship between two organisms where one, the parasite, benefits by living in or on the host and the host is harmed by the parasite. Simple examples that I think everyone should be familiar with would be mosquitoes sucking on the blood of animals and ticks or lice that do the same. Less commonly thought of are things like uh, Rafflesia, the biggest and one of the smelliest flowers. They actually are parasites. They grow on the uh, roots or trunks or branches of other trees and suck the nutrients out of them. Notice that Rafflesia doesn't really have any of its own leaves to photosynthesize. And if you're wondering, up here, that's a nest with bird eggs, but there's one bird egg which is slightly different from the others. That's a cuckoo egg. The cuckoo is actually a sort of parasite where the cuckoo lays its egg in the nest of other birds and leaves it there. When the egg hatches, the bird that comes back to roost in that nest may not be able to tell the difference between its own children and the invader and end up taking care of the cuckoo as though it was its own. In this case, the parasitism is where the cuckoo takes advantage of the services of other species' mothers at the expense of that host species' own actual offspring. Okay, so after discussing those different types of relationships, I hope it's clear that uh, the interaction between organisms within an ecosystem is very complex. There are many factors which we may not be able to account for whenever something in the environment changes. This frequently leads to unintended consequences. And therefore, we have realized that there is great importance in conserving our environment to prevent the extinction of plants and animals, to maintain a stable and balanced ecosystem, to continue to discover scientific value from wildlife, to preserve natural scenery and wildlife for human appreciation, to maintain biodiversity. Now, all these talking points may seem a little bit uh, blunt and self-serving, but there are actual value in them. For example, cutting down trees generally leads to soil erosion. Soil erosion generally leads to shallower river banks or polluted rivers. Cutting down trees also leads to the destruction of natural reservoirs of water. In general, cutting down trees would harm humans in the long run by decreasing the water quality by decreasing our food sources because the animals can no longer live there, by decreasing air quality. In fact, it has been found in places where the environment have been extensively exploited or destroyed with no thought for the longer term outcome. The quality of living for humans in those environments generally are much poorer. Therefore, if we are to move forward, it is important to take into account the preservation of key environmental services. Because once we computed the environmental service value that our nature provides us, it was found that it was quite immeasurable in comparison to whatever commercial value we may have obtained from cutting down a tree. 
for example, cutting down a tree for its wood would be beneficial in the short term, but in the long term, we are losing out on the clean air, the oxygen that it could have provided. And it is something that is not possible to replace in the longer term.